So, uh, Bethine, um, tell me when and where you were born. Well, I was there, I always was a little embarrassed. I was born in Salt Lake City because we didn't have a hospital in uh, that was equipped well in uh, near Mackey. So uh, my father and mother had lost a baby boy 14 years before I was born. And so they weren't taking any chances. So we went to Salt Lake. But I spent my first Christmas at the ranch up in the uh, Stanley Basin at, Sa at uh, the ranch on the Salmon River, which was called Robinson Bar Ranch. All right, all right. Now, when were you born? In 1923, on the 2nd of February. Um, tell me a little bit about your parents, if you would, please. Well, Pop, Pop was a lawyer and uh, governor, and he was in the legislature from Custer County and from Bonneville County. So he had a long career, and after he was governor, he uh, became a federal judge. And his name was Chase Clark? Chase Clark, yes. His brother was governor before he was, and that was Brazilla Clark. And uh, uh, when Pop was working for the uh, governor, in Boise, he was the adjutant to the governor, and uh, he went, he went to, you know, with the National Guard to uh, down to uh, uh, Mexico uh, on his way home after they disbanded. On his way home, he had a car accident and hurt his arm, and my mother said. I think we should have you near the hot spring, and there's a wonderful one, that the stagecoach up at uh, Robinson Bar, and uh, that was an old, old gold bar, and uh, that was why they called it a Robinson Bar, because it was a, where they took gold out of a bar right out at the end of the property. So this would have been around the end of World War I? Uh, no, actually, it was before uh, the real, it was about 1914. Okay. And they homesteaded the ranch, and Pop, with the natural hot water spring, got his arm back, and then the whole family came and stayed and, uh, and made the two pools that are there. There are two natural hot water pools. Now, when you say you moved directly there, did you move there from Mackey? Your family moved there from Mackey? Or? No, they did. They moved from Mackey. Your there. mom and dad? Yeah, I wasn't born yet. Okay, but they had previously been living in Mackey. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, Papa, was, when he was over here with the governor, he, uh, he uh, was in Boise, and Mom came with him. Every summer, we went there, uh -huh. and Pop would drive up from Mackey, where he was a lawyer, and at that time, Mackey was a boom town. It was a copper, they had a copper mill, uh, there were fights between the, uh, uh, between the uh, sheep men and the cattle men, and he was always involved with litigation, but he'd come up the river up over what we called Five Points. So did he stay in Mackey and work and yeah. come back and forth? Yeah, he came up, he came up every, every weekend. Oh. Mm -hmm. And my mother ran the ranch, and she could cut up a steer because her father had been in a, a butcher shop in Mackey. Oh. And so there wasn't anything my mother couldn't do. <laughs> well, how big was the ranch? How many acres? 123. Uh-huh. When Frank wanted to make the SNRA, uh, first they talked about making it a uh, park, mm -hmm. but it got it, it just got too complicated, and they thought for the uh, small acreage, having all those uh, facilities to take care of park people wouldn't be a good idea. Mm -hmm. So 
they wanted to make it a sawtooth recreation area. Mm -hmm. And while he was fighting that, our ranch was on the far side of it. The right. boulder white clouds were right behind us. Mm -hmm. And Stanley was 19 miles from us. And there, there were the uh, sawtooths. So we were right in between. And we were in God's Green Valley. It was by Warm Springs Creek. And it ran into the Salmon River. And uh, there, were, there were so many salmon that my father, when he'd come up from being in the law office, he'd be in his, in his suit. And all he'd do is take off his top coat. He'd get in the waders and he'd go fishing on a fly rod for salmon. Oh. And you could just see them down at the end of the, uh, of the uh, meadow, uh, our lower meadow. We had an upper meadow and a lower meadow. And at the end of that meadow was where the Salmon River made the bend around to meet Warm Springs Creek. And as it made the bend around, you, the salmon would just be thick there and Pop would catch him on a fly rod. But my mother finally said, we're going broke feeding people who drive up to here and say, we can't go on up the road. It's too dark and too late and we can't find our way. And she said, we're going to, we're going to go broke putting them all up and feeding them. So she, it became a dude ranch oh. and she ran it. Oh, and then, I see. that was when I was when I was little, it had already become a dude ranch, oh, okay. and Mom was running it. Bethany, you mentioned that um, you had an older brother that didn't survive. Did you have any other brothers and sisters? No, no I was an only You're child. Only child. Oh. Uh -huh. And it, I, I, I just came along by accident because they told, they'd been told by a doctor that they couldn't have any more children. Mom had been terribly ill. With, uh, trouble with her kidneys and everything else. And it almost died. And my pop took her out of Mackey on a special train to California. And that was about the time that uh, he spent all the money that that year in California getting her well. Then he had a he managed to have a really fine law practice until the uh, the depression closed the banks. It closed the bank in Mackey, and he was one of the directors. And he said the little old people that had money there would not be able to get any of it back, and nor to make enough of it. So he sold everything he had in Stanley Basin. He had much, a lot of property in Stanley Basin oh, really? with a, a friend from from uh, Salt Lake. And they sold all the cattle they were running on it. And he put the money back into the bank so that people could have the money that oh, they had really? lost. And then oh. we moved over to Idaho Falls because my grandmother was there. Oh, okay, so you moved. Now, when you were, um, before you moved to Idaho Falls, then, did you go to grade school in Mackey? Yes, up to the third grade. Oh. And then uh, when we went over to Idaho Falls, I went to school there for 17 years. <laughs> that is, I, until I was 17, I was in high school uh -huh. when we left for Pop to become governor. What was um, grade school like in Mackey? There probably weren't very many kids, were there? Oh, it was pretty full because oh, really? everybody from all around the area came in to Mackey to go to school. We had the ranch. Uh, after my mother read, didn't run it anymore when she was the governor's wife, uh, my Aunt Beulah, who was my mother's half-sister and had been raised from the time she was about 14, 7 or 14, I don't remember quite, uh, she'd been raised by Pop and Mom. So she always seemed like she was my big sister oh. and she was 20 years older than I was. And when Frank said, as a senator, that he thought it would be improper for him to have an inholding in an area he was trying to make a part of the Sawtooth Recreation Area, because it was right on the edge of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it could be put under easement. 
and he said it would be a terrible thing for that 123 acres to be to be uh, developed. And as he felt the same way about the whole Stanley Basin. I remember when we drove over Galena one time, stopped on the the viaduct, we saw down below we saw them cutting roads and putting up uh, telephone poles and making a very big mess in the valley. And that's when Frank decided that they had to make an SNRA. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was so, such a purist about taking any money. He said, there are people who get rich at the federal trough, but I'm not going to be one of them. And so he, uh, he we sold it for 140 $140,000 and we split it with Beulah. When your father became governor and, and you moved over to Boise, then then your aunt Beulah, she continued to operate it as a dude ranch? She ran it uh -huh. Uh -huh. For, for years after that. Uh -huh. We'd go up there in the summer uh, whenever Frank could get away and, and the kids. And she took, uh, our sons were two years, nine years apart. But she'd take the two of them for the summer up there. Oh. So both Forrest and Chase had a chance to enjoy it. But when Frank was senator and had done the SNRA with uh, McClure and, and uh, Hanson and of course C. Sanders and uh, uh, all of the people who were involved in making the SNRA. After that, uh, for a long time, we didn't have anything in that area. And then he decided he wanted to do the uh, river return, no return, wilderness. And uh, I went to every one of his hearings with him. And he had hearings in every part of the state, uh, near Stanley, in fact, in Chalice, all up in the north because the river of no return wilderness reaches up over a huge portion of that part of Idaho. Yes. So we had hearings everywhere. But the a hearing I remember most was the hearing in in uh, Chalice or Salmon. It was in Salmon. And they had a a sort of a uh, uh, a building that was just made out of wood and had uh, wood steps and an aisle and they set up chairs and the people from the Senate were there at the end to hold a hearing on whether they should make it into a wilderness. Mm -hmm. And this man got a horse and rode it up the, the wooden steps and down the aisle and turned around and rode back out, and it turned out the uh, the man who was running the newspaper there in Salmon said, well, Mrs. Church, what did you think of that? I said, it's a mighty fine-looking horse. <laughs> and Frank said, I'm glad he asked you that. <laughs> well, was the person, were the people in, in Salmon, were they opposed to Oh, the yes. Man? Deeply. Deeply? Deeply. And in Stanley, uh, well, Stanley was so adamant about the SNRA. They were, they were adamant that Frank was going to ruin the whole area. It was going to take away their livelihood. And uh, when Frank was dying at home for three months of the second cancer he had in his life, uh, he'd, had, he'd had a bad cancer 36 years before when our son Forrest was born. And uh, they said he was going to die then. So he always said he had 36 years to do what he wanted to do. So he was never going to put his finger up in the wind and say, will this get me reelected, or is it the right thing to do? So he was able to do what he wanted he to do. He did. From then on, after surviving that first cancer, he said, I've been given a lease on life so I could do, I could do what I think I should do. 
and so he he thoroughly enjoyed being senator. I think up until the last year or so when everything got so contentious in Washington. Mm -hmm. Because before that, he worked with both sides of the aisle. Mm -hmm. Tell me about uh, when and where you met Frank. I actually met him, uh, I was in uh, a student government in Idaho Falls. He was in student government in Boise, and we had a student government association meeting in Boise. I met Frank. He asked me out, but a young man who was a, uh, a basketball player asked me first, so I said, I'm sorry. But Frank wasn't deterred at all. He said, that's fine. We'll just go on being friends. Now, and how, so, how old were you then? About 16. Oh. And but, you were living in Idaho Falls, and was he living in Boise? Oh, yeah. Okay. He was ra born and raised in Boise. Oh, okay born at St. Alphonsus and was raised here. And uh, <laughs> he, uh, he then, the year, the year that I graduated, I was a year ahead of him, he became the student body president in Boise. And I went on to Boise Junior College. Did you finish high school in Boise then? At Boise and Idaho Falls. I'm, our superintendent of schools said that I was, I was so involved in both schools. I was only here a half a year, but I got so involved with Boise that I graduated there, but then he let me graduate with my class in Idaho Falls, too. So you stayed in touch with Frank after that first meeting for you? Well, said? actually, uh, we went together uh, uh, while he was the student party president and I was out at Boise State. We went together to the dances at uh, at high school at Boise High. Uh, we went out together. Now, did Frank um, was he familiar with the the sawtooths and the, the white clouds before he hooked up with you, or did you kind of introduce? No, him? I introduced him to that then because I took him to the ranch, uh -huh. and Pop would take he and Carl Burke out to show them the mine on the other side of the river, way up the mountain. And they'd go up uh, Warm Springs Creek to the 12-mile meadow, and we'd all camp out. Mm -hmm. And so that was it. But when he was a kid here in, in uh, Boise, he used to go up to Warm Lake with his parents, up near, uh, out of McCall, you know, Warm Lake uh -huh. area. Do. And he'd go up there with them, and they'd go, uh, fishing and and hiking and all around. Mm -hmm. He became an intelligence officer. Now he was in World War II. Uh, was that before? That was before you were married, wasn't it? Yes. And uh, he came back, and he hadn't finished college, so he uh, he finished college. Then we were married, and we went on a a two month honeymoon or three months almost down to Mexico, came back, and we went out almost immediately, packed the car, and left for uh, Boston. He went to Harvard for a year, and he got on the... Uh, and he was still in undergraduate school then? Uh, no, he was going you, by... He finished just before we were married. Okay. He finished the, the week before we were married. Did he go to Stanford? Uh, uh, well, he went to Stanford, but then he went to Harvard for a year, and then he got, he, he was having horrible back pains, and we were about to have uh, forest. So I said, we can't do this winter in Boston again. Let's go back to, to Stanford. So he transferred back to Stanford to get his law degree. And if he hadn't, he probably would have died because he had this terrible cancer. You know, his backache wasn't just from studying. It was a testicular cancer. And they told him that he was not going to live. But he went to Stanford uh, to a fine doctor in the city who said, oh yes, we'll put you on 
it, we've got a new deep radiation. So they really, they really burned him up for about uh, six weeks from here down to here. And uh, I think that's what probably caused his uh, pancreatic cancer 36 years later. But it gave him 36 yeah. years. Yeah. Now, where were you married? On the front porch of the ranch. That's, I thought so. Yeah. And, uh, and it just snowed madly over Galena two days before we were married on the 21st of June. And it snowed two days before. And all of our friends had to go up over Galena, which wasn't fixed then. Right. It was still a gravel road. It too. was awful. And it was twisty. But uh, I remember most of my family and most of his family didn't know each other. And they had to access, at that point they were accessing the ranch over Galena? Over Galena. Mm -hmm. And it was horrible. And it was a big snowstorm. Was it a big wedding? Was it was people? pretty big. Mm -hmm. About, I don't know. I remember we had every, every room in the lodge filled. Every room in the outer cabins filled. So then we went out and had this log honeymoon and then went, went to, back to east to Harvard, then back to Stanford, then survived the first cancer and then, then he, he died of the second one 36 years later and he'd had 24 years in the Senate. So he said he'd had a good run for it. Yeah, yeah. You were talking a, a, a short while ago about people having to go over Galena to, to get to Robinson Bar to your wedding. Do you remember the first time you went over Galena? Mm, yes, but it was, uh, it was a Thanksgiving and I was learning to drive. I think I was about 14 mm -hmm. and we drove out of uh, out of uh, Ketchum and up over Galena, uh -huh. and we, as we started up, I lost traction, and uh, my pop said, well, there's no way we're going to go on down now, now, and he got out, and I got out, and he got back in and backed up to where we could get a little traction to make it back down the hill, oh. so we didn't get to the ranch that time. Oh. And one other time we were going with my uncle Brazil. We were going up the uh, uh, the uh, road that I ex reminded you was on the other side of the river, and it had five points. Right. And we almost slipped off of one of them. And Uncle Brazil and Pop were holding the car on. My mother was driving, and they managed to keep it from sliding off the hill. And so everybody walked in and they said a, a, a horse and a sleigh back and picked up everything. And then we had our Thanksgiving dinner there. Oh, oh. And I went in the hot water pool that one time in the winter when it was 45 below zero up there. Yeah, I wanted to ask you if you spent, I know it was, you know, for the Dude Ranch it was a summer uh, facility, but did you guys spend some winter time up there? Well, we had spent the winter time when I was a baby. When you were a baby. And when I was really very young. In fact, was I Was that got, because of, of uh, the homesteading? Well, no, it was because uh, they thought there was a lot of whooping cough. And they thought they ought to get me away from it. Oh. And a little girl came through one night and they said they needed to stay. And my mom let them. And when she heard him cough, her cough, she knew we were in trouble. And I got hoofy cough, and that was the second time in their lives they had to take the family down to uh, uh, California to get over something. Oh, wow. My mother had, and then I came down with the hoofy cough. And I was so sick. So you went all the way to California? Yeah. Because oh. we had to get the war air, warm air. Oh. Well, normally, did you just kind of shut the ranch up for the winter? Yes. Usually we had the caretaker there. Uh-huh. Were the winters pretty extreme? Oh, yeah. 
those days there were just tons of silk. <laughs> what, um, after Frank, um, got into politics and you were, um, he was in the Senate, did you get back to the ranch much? Well, uh, there were several years that the kids stayed there with Beulah. And we would go for a week or so. Mm -hmm. And then there were years after that that we would just go visit it. Mm -hmm. But uh, after, after Frank was in the Senate, it got very hard to do. Yeah. And finally we got to the point where our vacations, we'd come out here and campaign in the summer. But our vacations were really usually at, uh, at Easter time. We'd go down fishing in the Caribbean or something. It was just too, too hard on Frank to go to the mountains because they were always mad at him over wilderness. <laughs> uh, well, in the early years, um, were you and he able to spend quite a bit of time there? Not really. Uh, sometimes I spent quite a bit of time in high school. Did you, um, well, when you were there, what did you do? Did you do a lot of fishing? Did you ride? Did you well, they always said that it wasn't any fun fishing with me because I usually went swimming. Did you have cousins that were there oh, yeah. with you? Yeah. I had a, one cousin, Dale Patterson whose son Scott just called me a few minutes ago. Uh -huh. uh, he lived with us because his father died during the First World War of the flu epidemic that was a lot like this H-I-I-I flu or whatever it is. Swine flu. Yeah. See, uh, he died of it. He was a doctor. And so my Aunt Mabel and uh, Dale came and lived with us. In Mackey, she, well, he was in the war. Uh, she, she was Pop's secretary. But uh, later on, even when we lived in Idaho Falls and here in, in Boise, uh, they often lived with us. And after he was married, she lived with Pop and Mom too. So even though you didn't have siblings, you you had oh we had lots of kids. Uh, yeah, and one of the reasons I came home to Idaho, besides the fact that I really wanted to do something other than what I was doing out there, after Frank died, I stayed for about four years and worked with the Democratic National Committee. Yeah. But um, I really wanted to come home. But I didn't have any idea of what I was going to do or where I was going to live. Frank passed away in 84. 84. Mm -hmm. And I came back in 89. Uh -huh. um, let me, I was going to ask you a little more about the SNRA. Um, I, I know Frank was, you know, very instrumental in that along with a, a, a few other people, but... Um, Actually, it was his idea, mm -hmm. and that and that sprang from from just my pop saying that was the most wonderful valley in the world, and our having been over there when it was pristine and beautiful, and he saw all the building and Sun Valley and all those places, mm -hmm. and he just thought if they could protect that area and make it like a ranch area, mm -hmm. so that it looked like it had looked back in Pop's day, it would be worthwhile. And you were starting to see a lot of development. Well, what happened was uh, we first saw they were going to build uh, a new little city down there. and They put roads and everything. And that's when he decided to do the SNRA. Was that Obsidian? Uh-huh. And then, <laughs> when I came home and was here, I saw this article in the saw to in the uh, uh, paper here that they were planning all sorts of building up in the sawtooth, and there's 
someone who is thinking of making a major development again. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I called everybody to make the Satu Society. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember who, um, I know there were, you know, a lot of the local people that were opposed to the SNRA, but who were some of the political opponents? Do you remember? Oh, most of the, uh, most of the people who were in, uh, in the legislature and such, in the Republican legislature, were against it. The Idaho? Uh-huh. Yeah. What about nationally? Well, nationally, they didn't, uh, actually, they didn't know Idaho existed. <laughs> so they didn't know where the Satus were anyway. No. <laughs> no. No, they really didn't. They didn't know where Idaho was. Yeah. Every time they'd say that Frank was a national figure, they'd say, where is he from? And they'd say, Idaho. Where's that? I was going to ask you, um, you know, through the years, the Forest Service has been you know, very instrumental in the Sawtooth Salmon River country because they manage such a big the chunk area. Of forest And they haven't had enough money. Yeah, I was And getting... that's why I think it was important for us to be a private group who could help them, help them with, with our uh, senators so that we could uh, get the land and water fund monies running again. After Frank went out in 80, they just decimated the land and water fund monies. They put it into everything else. Now, and that money, I'm not familiar with that. That money that has money. historically been used. Yes, for, for, uh, for the Forest Service and for the land improvement. Oh. But it stopped coming in. That's what put us, 90% of the easement was done with land with that kind of money. Mm -hmm. And when when the U.S. found itself going broke, they went into those funds and took them to use for every other thing. So they weren't available to the Forest Service. Mm -hmm. So the Forest Service was cut down, though they had more people to cope with all the time, they were cut down from the amount of monies they had. And they really needed a advocacy group that was local that could help them. And people really cared so much. Idaho, they always have loved that area. Yeah. And I think it stayed, it has stayed very viable simply because we did work with the Forest Service. When we didn't agree with them, we told them so. But when we agreed, we backed them up heartily. So we really came out very well on it, I think. Oh, yeah. And of course, the one reason they were able to get the SRA is they, they let Stanley be itself. It's mm -hmm. a self... Uh, <laughs> Stanley's self pretty independent. Uh, very independent. <laughs> yeah. were, the, are, were there any <clears throat> particular individuals in the Forest Service that you remember that were really instrumental or helpful like, like in regard to the SNRA? Or? Well, Tom Kovalicki was always wonderful. He uh, ran the Nez Perce mm -hmm. and cared very much about the SNRA. And he'd bring a whole group of people in to build those log worm fences. And uh, also Paul Reese and a radio man from Ketchum. Uh, when I first got the idea, and they had the idea, they, we met, all the three of us, met over in uh, Ketchum and uh, talked about what could be done. Yeah. What about Forest Service people back in the early 70s when Frank was working on creating the SNRA? Were there, was, were there people in the Forest Service that were very involved with that as well? <sighs> well, you know, I try to think back to the ones that I, I met in their office back there. Uh, and there were those who were rather big supporters and those who I think thought that putting more money into uh, Twin Falls and, and into Idaho was a mistake. Oh, really? So, you know, you had people you were battling against 
then there was Jim Lyons, who was just a terrific supporter. Mm -hmm. He's on the Sauter Society board, now, yeah, I believe. Yeah, now he is. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he was working with the Forest Service in Washington. He, um, I was going to ask you a few more things about Robinson Bar. You know, when you were a child there, did you have, um, I mean, did you have indoor plumbing? Did you have power? Um, well, we had a, uh, they had a dam and they put a uh, municipal power, I mean a, uh, a uh, power pump in the river. Okay. It was run by the dam. Uh -huh. It was, it was a flume. That carried oh. the water down to it. Okay, so that's how you got water. Uh -huh. And once in a while, sticks would get caught in it, and all of our lights would go very dim, and everybody'd have to go out and clean the the thing off so that the water could flow through again. So you sort of had your own little power system yeah. there. Yeah. Oh. And we had we had indoor plumbing, but we didn't have a, a, a toilets. We had the toilets down by the river. Oh. Okay. were outdoor. Okay. Uh -huh right down the hill. <laughs> yeah. And you obviously wouldn't have had phones back then. Well, we had the old phone that you went like this. The crank? Uh-huh. Oh. And we were on a, we were on a, uh, a line that everybody was on. Uh-huh. And you'd hear them and occasionally you'd have to say, if you could get off, I'll be off in a few minutes. <laughs> and I remember how many rings we had. When you were at the ranch, did you um, did you ever go you visit places like Custer and Bay Horse? Those old oh, once in a while we'd go up to Custer because uh, uh, we thought the dredge, the dredge boys came down and would date the girls that were uh, working at the ranch. Oh. And then they'd go up to Stadley on Saturday night for the Stadley Stomp. Did you do that? Uh-huh. But I was too young to really be a big part of it. Did you, um, so when you were spending summers at the ranch, did you go into Stanley much? Oh, just on occasion. Uh -huh. But we also, uh, when I was young, really young, we used to go on a camp at Redfish. Did you? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Here we were in a rustic setting of our own in our own beds. And we go camping at Redfish. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Well, it's wonderful you. to talk with you.